Okay, everybody. So uh, thanks for being here today. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you. Uh, my name is Stephen Moldrum. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm an assistant professor in bioethics and health humanities here at the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston. Um, and I am the faculty coordinator of this year's uh, bioethics and health humanities seminar series. Uh, today's talk by Dr. Justin M. Feldman is made possible by the endowment of the Marcel and Josephine Patterson Memorial Lecture in the Medical Humanities. So thank you very much to our benefactors. And without further delay, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Justin M. Feldman, who is currently a visiting scholar at the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University. Uh, Dr. Feldman is a social epidemiologist who has published widely on a range of topics, including the issues of deaths in police custody in the United States, the negative effects uh, of eviction on health, and the increasingly prominent role of the private sector in public health. Dr. Feldman has also published about the political economy of the COVID-19 pandemic and the US federal response to the pandemic, uh, which is the subject of his talk today, titled How to Hide a Plague, How Elite Capture and Individualism Make COVID Normal. Uh, it's also my understanding that Dr. Feldman is working on a book about this topic, which is very exciting. Uh, and over the last two years, Dr. Feldman's writing about the mismanagement of the COVID-19 pandemic in venues such as Protean Magazine and academic journals such as JAMA Open Network, as well as his uh, presence on social media on various platforms, have made him uh, a very distinctive voice in this space, and uh, I would argue a singular and very important voice. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome him here today. So, uh, Dr. Feldman, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Stephen, for the invite and for having me today and, and to the department. Um, and that was probably the best introduction I've ever had. So thank you for that. Um, so yeah, the um, let me let me share my slides. I'm gonna gonna take one second. Apologize. Okay, there we go. So it is true. Um, I am working on a book with Abby Cardis, who is also an epidemiologist. She's at Brown University. Um, and this is the title. It is with um, University of Chicago Press, slated to come out in 2024. We still have to write the thing. <laughs> so what I'm about to show to you represents some of my initial thinking and, and some of my joint thinking with Abby. Um, if you like the ideas, they're probably uh, Abby's and any Anything you don't like or think is wrong, uh, you can solely attribute to me. Um, so I will start by uh, with, with this title slide. The background is, um, it's called The Ruins. It is the ruins of a small pox hospital on Roosevelt Island in New York City. Uh, there is a push to turn this into a permanent COVID memorial site. Currently, there is only one permanent COVID memorial site in the entire United States. It's in a small town on the Jersey Shore. Uh, and that kind of reminds me of the 1918 flu pandemic uh, for which there are zero um, permanent collective, uh, per permanent memorials. And yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm planting a seed that will, will come up later in the presentation about um, collective responses and collective memory to pandemics and, and why we may or, or may not have those things. Um, and here's uh, a, another seed I want to plant for the upcoming slides, which uh, this is actually Abby's paraphrase of a Bruno Latour chapter title. <laughs> and when the controversies flare up, the debates get technical. So four days ago, uh, for any of you following this, uh, President Biden was on the CBS show 60 Minutes and he was being interviewed at uh, the Detroit Auto Show. And he was asked by the interviewer uh, whether the pandemic was over. And he answered affirmatively that yes, the pandemic is over. Uh, there have been some, uh, there's been some speculation about whether he really meant that. Uh, he did follow up saying deaths would continue. Um, there was some pushback internally we see from, from uh, some media within the White House that uh, not everyone is on board with this messaging. But we also, a couple days after that, had the White House Chief of Staff um, 
go on Andy Slavitt's podcast. He's a public health figure close to the White House, uh, saying we aren't done beating COVID. He says, yes, um, Biden is correct that the pandemic's basically over. We aren't done beating COVID or dealing with the economic impact. We aren't done dealing with climate change. We aren't done dealing with racism. We have many problems less to solve. Uh, so he's kind of claim here is kind of relativizing COVID as a not exceptional singular problem, but saying it is one among many of the problems we have to face. And um, in, in my reading of this, he is not trying to lend additional urgency to climate change or, or racism, but instead um, kind of assimilating COVID into uh, what I'll lay out in a bit, a model of social problems, uh, the, a kind of dominant model. Um, by which societies address social problems. So this, um, the statement by Biden predictably uh, unleashed a, a wave of op-eds, um, a technical debate going on about whether or not Biden is correct in saying that the pandemic is over with um, some people, some writers saying yes, some saying no, some saying, hey, it's complicated. What do we do about this? Uh, but at issue in these, what, what are on the surface technical debates about whether we're in a pandemic, um, there is the more substantive debate about what uh, the US as a society should be doing right now about COVID as reflected in our social norms, our laws, our distribution and redistribution of resources. Uh, and, and these questions represent different policy preferences to put it in a kind of more neutral term or to put it in a less naive way, uh, different material interests in people's experiences of the pandemic. And uh, that's largely defined by class, race, disability status, one's position within uh, this world of new world of COVID risk. So the, there are some biological or epidemiologic uh, definitions of what a pandemic is, uh, although there is no decisive uh, consensus here. Generally, we say that a disease is in an epidemic phase or pandemic phase when it is unstable. There's not predictable, consistent levels. Uh, to put it even more technically, the effective reproduction rate is greater than one. So on average, every one person with an infection goes on to infect more than one person. Therefore, large waves can be sustained. Uh, and then the pandemic part of it is about uh, the disease being present in multiple countries or regions. Uh, but then there is a social definition for what a pandemic is. And it's essentially a state of exception when um, society acts in a way that is different normally th than they normally would have acted. And, and um, by taking various precautions or measures or laws, changing social norms, it's all about um, basically acknowledging that this is a clear and present danger and responding uh, as a collective. So there's a couple of historians, um, Charter and Haveman, who were thinking through this question of how do pandemics end? When will the COVID-19 pandemic end? And they were looking at historical precedents um, and comparing it to the, the moment in which they were writing in 2021 when, when things were uh, even worse than they are right now. Uh, so they are arguing that, um, so, it, we transition from epidemic or pandemic to an endemic phase when there's a lack of overarching narrative because the disease does not require an explanation and it comes to appear as the natural order of things and things go back to normal. Uh, when I first read this and when I first put this on the slide, honestly, I basically agreed with it. Um, but this part where they say, um, endemic diseases lack an overarching narrative and do not require explanation, I'm going to turn this on its head. I'm going to say that there's actually a process by which an epidemic becomes an endemic in a social sense, be precisely because a set of narratives develop and those narratives are able to um, invisibilize deaths, 
um, are able to individualize responsibility, individualize people's experiences of the pandemic. And yeah, so this is just from back in May, this, this wave we had uh, of COVID infections uh, after the major Omicron wave uh, that, that was in the past winter. And um, with some uh, experts saying that this is a, a wave, but a hidden wave. Uh, and I would say the, process, the social process by which uh, we turn a pandemic disease into an endemic disease in the US is nearing completion. The only major steps remaining at this point have been what the White House uh, COVID coordinator Ashish Jha has called commercializing the, uh, the tools used to fight COVID infection, which in this case are vaccines, tests, and treatment. And by commercializing here, he means uh, rather than those being tools that the government provides, it's instead provided through private insurance and, and the private uh, healthcare system. So when COVID first came to the US, um, particularly thinking about mid to late February of 2020, and then into March, we had this pretty exceptional response, uh, exceptional by the standards of the US, where we can't seem to build up many social welfare programs. Uh, the, at least the last 40 years of policy has largely gone in the direction of privatizing, of uh, whittling down the welfare state, of um, shifting new risks or existing risks from uh, capital to the working class. But we had this huge dramatic response in mo mostly March 2020, where several uh, laws and executive orders and actions were passed at the federal level. We had in the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, a guarantee of paid sick leave at a, a very large number of employers. And that was in place for all of 2020. We had the CARES Act, which I think may have been the largest spending bill in US history, which uh, gave stimulus payments to people, um, directly to people. Um, there was a dramatic expansion of the unemployment insurance system, such that with the 600 extra dollars on top of what workers otherwise would have got, they um, were typically making more money than they would have staying on the job. Uh, there was an eviction moratorium done through uh, executive action by the Trump administration. And these were passed with overwhelming support in Congress and signed by a particularly reactionary president. Uh, so I think it's important to, to try to like unpack what actually happened here. Uh, and this uh, federal fiscal spending, which provided payment to people should they not be able to work and payment to businesses, um, regardless of whether or not they closed, but um, if they did close or were restricted, was able to subsidize them in that case. That allowed states and local governments to pass policies um, that closed or restricted businesses. Uh, and there was a, uh, every state on this map that's blue uh, did some kind of stay at home and or business restriction order all but seven states. So this is a vast majority of the country, including in pretty um, solidly Republican areas. And there were also shifts in uh, social norms and behaviors uh, to eventually to wearing masking, to social distancing, to uh, being in bubbles and really large, large numbers of people um, and, and majorities of the US population were, were living very different lives in large parts of, of 2020. Uh, and beyond this collective policy uh, response to the pandemic, there was also collective social response um, in terms of messaging. People were telling each other they needed to work to flatten the curve. That was a collective goal where everyone could do their part, make sure the healthcare system wasn't overloaded in its capacity. There was a... Um, sort of ritual by which people were thanking essential workers. Um, and I, I don't mean to romanticize the initial period of the COVID response, uh, which I think in one of the dominant narratives at least is marked by a failure to provide uh, PPE, pr protective uh, personal protective equipment to essential workers, many deaths, actions that were much too slow. 
uh, to, to many people died in this period, but I do mean to complicate it. And, and uh, I, I do think there's a danger of forgetting this exceptional policy response and exceptional social response where a highly individual, individual country came to frame the problem as social, came to re really redistribute wealth and power um, to the working class, uh, which is not something that typically happens in the US. And then um, ever since then, ever since those initial weeks, there has been a push or multiple pushes, depending on how you think about, to take COVID an exceptional and collective um, problem and assimilate it into the dominant model uh, by which societies treat health and social problems. And I argue that this model um, treats individuals rather than the collective. It's focused on treating people who have already reached some pretty acute stage of say poverty or disease rather than preventing those uh, conditions from happening in the first place. And there is a commitment to provide by, by all, all but the most extreme actors uh, in this system, there is a push to provide a modest welfare state where certain individuals will be um, with particularly acute problems will have their needs addressed to a degree. Uh, it, it's going to be highly flawed and it's going to be delivered not as a right, but as uh, a benefit to which some people, um, especially if they're deserving and, and pass some kind of means testing process uh, are, able to, um, are, are able to attain. Uh, and, and I'm putting, there's so many ways to talk about the history of this, but I wanna put these two men over here. <laughs> this is how I wanna, I wanna tell the, the history of it. So we have Thomas Malthus. Um, so he was a reverend and thinker in the uh, late 17, early 1800s in the UK. He is famous for uh, saying, there is no right to live. He was writing at a time when the French Revolution had happened and uh, growing radicalism was uh, underway in the UK. And there was a pushback against this idea that people would have what is called positive liberties. So positive liberties are, are uh, the, the freedom to have healthcare and housing and education. Um, there was by, by his cohort and those who follow much more of an openness to um, negative liberties, which are freedom from cruel government treatment and government intervention rather than positive liberties. And he wrote a, a treatise uh, called On the Principle of Population. And he believed that there were natural laws preventing societies from taking care of the poor and the working class, because if they were taken care of uh, by the state uh, through redistribution from the capitalist class, that would lead to overpopulation. And the problem of overpopulation would be intractable because population would grow, fat, grow faster than agricultural capacity. Therefore, it was actually a good thing for um, poor people to not have resources uh, distributed to him. This kind of thinking was highly influential at the time. It's difficult to overstate how influential it was. One of the people it influenced was Edwin Chadwick, who was an early figure in, in uh, globally and in the UK in public health. And he was the person behind the Public Health Act, which set up a public health system in England. He was also behind what's called um, the poor laws, or some, some people call it the abolition of the poor laws. And this was a basically the, the first um, means tested welfare system in a modern sense, where they, they um, cut down or they, they forced people seeking charity and seeking benefits to go into workhouses and work if they were able to. And um, Chadwick called this in what we'd say in modern parlance, the first evidence-based policy or the first policy based on science is, is more like how he put it. And the science it was based on was Thomas Malthus's on, on the principle of population. Uh, so, so this model is being set out early on and it's something that's returned to with social Darwinism, with eugenics, 
with uh, neoliberal welfare reform in the 1980s and 90s in the US. But it's also important to note, there are many things that do not fit this model. And I would point to environmental and occupational health regulations. I would point to um, public education as a de facto right, K through 12 in the US. But those systems that do not fit into the model tend to be the systems that are most under attack. Um, So there's also a long history of collective health uh, being pitted against capitalist interests. So I'm gonna talk about a, a couple of examples here. In the mid 19th century in Great Britain and also the rest of Europe, um, there was a move against some of these medieval era public health uh, practices like quarantine, like cordon sanitaire, what we might today call lockdown, or some might call it that. Um, and in this newly developing industrial capitalist system, uh, you had the capitalist class very much opposed to these measures because they restricted trade, therefore they restricted commerce. Uh, and you also had some intellectuals, some of which were in this nascent field that would become public health, uh, who, came to believe because of these class interests that they themselves also embraced uh, that diseases were not spread from person to person. They were spread through miasmas, these kind of filth on the ground that smelled bad and the solution was cleaning it up, not restricting people's movements and not restricting commerce from flowing, uh, not restricting ships from entering harbors uh, and, and offloading their, uh, their merchandise after you know long periods of time, as was the practice under quarantine. So there was a rolling back of these centuries-old public health practices in the name of um, keeping capitalism flowing. Similarly, there was uh, an anti-mask movement, especially centered in San Francisco during the 1918 flu pandemic. This was organized by the local business elites. They thought that masks um, against the flu were going to drive tourists away at a time when they were trying to attract tourists. They were also going to drive um, people away from shopping, from going to restaurants, because in their view, it spread fear. So they came up with sets of arguments like the masks don't work. It's true at that time, masks were only made of gauze, so uh, they may not have worked very well. But again, you have this, um, organizing among capitalist interests against public health measures. Uh, and then you have a pretty well documented history of 20th century into 21st century campaigns, largely uh, promoted by specific um, business groups uh, against public health regulations and protections. You can think of anything from the lead paint industry to um, oil, uh, polluter, let's say polluters, manufacturers who um, are, are lobbying against EPA regulations, for instance. So that's, that's a pretty clear, more contemporary example. Uh, and these campaigns, whether from the 18th century, 19th century or, or today, tend to use similar rhetoric and similar uh, playbooks. Um, the, this language rhetoric of reaction comes from a book published in the 90s by political scientist Albert Hirschman. Um, and he, he came up with some ideas that date back to basically the French Revolution, um, perversity thesis and futility thesis. Perversity thesis says, our society's effort to solve a particular pro social problem will actually make that problem worse. Futility thesis says our efforts to solve a social problem will simply be ineffective. Individualization of responsibility says, yes, this is a problem, but it is your problem, not society's problem. And minimizing or soft denialism uh, are basically ways of contextualizing problem uh, to, to downplay its uh, acuity. And I put a few examples of individualizing responsibility here. So Ralph Nader wrote this book, Unsafe at Any Speeds, uh, I think back in the 60s. Before this book, most people, and certainly the auto industry, conceptualized cars, uh, car safety, auto safety, as a problem of unsafe drivers. And Nader helped uh, recontextualize that as a problem of unsafe auto design. 
you also have the idea of a carbon footprint in terms of climate change was invented by BP, the oil company, as a way for people to direct their uh, concern over the climate to their own consumption behavior rather than collective political action. And another great example is the Keep America Beautiful campaign against littering, um, starting, I think, in the 70s. That campaign uh, was really done as a way to co-opt what were then early efforts to regulate disposable packaging and to, to ban disposable packaging um, as a way of turning the problem away from industry and towards personal behavior. Uh, so these conflicts between businesses and a collective public health response on COVID have been there from the beginning. And to me, they are as clear as day, but I would also argue that they have not made their way into the central narratives describing the US's failures and in some case, unique failures uh, to respond to the pandemic. Uh, I think the dominant narratives are around political partisanship, misinformation, anti-science sentiments, um, and this construct of pandemic fatigue where people are just getting tired of complying with public health measures. And I think there is probably some degree of truth in all of those narratives, but I think they are uh, in some cases misleading and uh, certainly partial. This conflict between business and COVID has been there since the beginning. The uh, US Chamber of Commerce lobbied uh, Congress during the CARES Act strongly against expanding unemployment insurance. Uh, unemployment insurance was an essential part of the public health response. It allowed for closures of non-essential businesses. It also allowed for higher risk um, people, workers, um, workers with family members who are high risk or who needed to do childcare to collect unemployment. So you have uh, that as an early lobbying campaign. Many, many state and local level lawsuits by particular businesses or industry associations against business closures or capacity restrictions. Um, you had two attempts by the Biden White House, one of which died in the White House itself, the other of which died in the Supreme Court um, to regulate occupational safety and health for COVID were uh, lobbied against in the first case by industry groups like the US Chamber of Commerce, National Association of Manufacturers, or brought to the Supreme Court by industry groups. So the, the, the lead plaintiff in the lawsuit against the vaccine or test mandate um, that would have applied to many workplaces was uh, the uh, National Association representing retailers arguing that these measures would restrict hiring and make it too difficult for hiring, especially for the upcoming holiday season at the point when they brought the, the lawsuit. Businesses had been expo uh, opposed to mask mandates. You had, in recent times, two jurisdictions in the country, um, or two major jurisdictions, let's say, uh, either attempt to or entertain the idea of bringing back mask mandates. Those were Los Angeles and Philadelphia. In both cases, there was vocal business association uh, opposition to those measures saying in the case of LA, there was a letter from a local chamber of commerce saying that people would bring their business elsewhere if the mask mandates were brought back. Businesses oppose the halving of the uh, recommended isolation period. So, sorry, they oppose the initial 10 day isolation period um, during which people who are knowingly infected with COVID would uh, stay home from, from work. That was not a guarantee, that was guidance, that was, did not have the force of law, but it was cut to five days after lobbying by the uh, airline industry um, and also lobbying of the White House by governors who themselves are more directly um, uh, lobbied by class of interest in terms of the businesses in their states. Um, as I'll describe in a moment, there was, were business interests behind a concerted right-wing campaign against public health measures early on in the pandemic. And there's also, um, as I'll also describe in a bit, concerns that non-pharmaceutical interventions, so these public health measures other than um, medical treatment and vaccination, would lead to increased inflation or um, at least no resolution to the inflation problem. Um, in May 2020, uh, there was a conference call 
um, actually the first the first one was in April, but the one that happened on May 11th uh, had its audio leaked to uh, media by an organization called the Council for National Policy. It's basically a coordinating group for what's called movement conservatism. Um, so various sorts of right wing organizations were part of it, along with members of the Trump White House. I would push back a little bit on this AP headline saying GOP fronts pro, uh, pro Trump doctors. Um, it's not just the GOP, it's the entire ecosystem of right-wing organizations. It's not, um, it's not like the, the um, national party itself that is alone in doing this. So there were conversations about how do we organize a campaign against public health measures? Um, and how do we get doctors and other experts on board with this to legitimize um, our, um, our push to remove public health measures? And uh, this is a, kind of an interesting change from prior decades, because you go back to the early 2000s, and there were Republicans explicitly saying that they didn't want science to be too much of a part of policymaking because it was bad for uh, economic interests or bad for people's lives. Uh, here, they're rejecting that completely, and they're saying, like, no, we, we, do, we do want the legitimacy of science behind us and experts behind us, um, at least at a discursive level, if not actual um, sound scientific reasoning. Um, so here is a secret White House meeting, at least that's how it's described by Scott Atlas, who was a um, Hoover Institution fellow. Um, that Hoover Institution is a, a right-wing institution that um, is a right-wing think tank that is part of Stanford University. Um, so you had a push from Stan Stanford um, right-wing fellows and also uh, some medical scientists who were able to easily connect into this national effort and to the White House uh, fairly early on. Um, and you have a, a meeting arranged by Scott Atlas, who was a Hoover fellow who got appointed to the White House to be uh, to have a role in their their COVID response. Uh, and he brought in um, Joe Ladapo, who's now the Surgeon General of Florida, um, Martin Kuldar from Jay, Jay Bhattacharya, who who I'll, I'll mention a little bit later, but would come to front uh, this campaign, the Great Barrington Declaration, which is actually just an extension of this months long right wing campaign um, first coordinated by the Council for National Policy. And what the Great Barrington Declaration did was to um, kind of escalate the effort to um, make sure that these strong non pharmaceutical interventions, what they, they call lockdown, uh, they call everything lockdown. <laughs> they, they, they consider themselves opposed to lockdown. Um, but that also, as they were saying at the time, meant um, not testing people who were asymptomatic or young or healthy, for example. Um, and they they were uh, wrote many op eds. They were cited in right wing media. They were brought into uh, Florida by DeSantis to serve as like experts who would would legitimate their uh, abandonment of public health measures. And um, sorry. And they were basically successful. <laughs> um, the fall and winter of 2020 came. And despite uh, a, a major increase in cases, and that was the largest wave of the pandemic we've had. If you look at the charts, they're pretty astounding. There was no return of um, business closures or restrictions, largely. It was, it was a patchwork. Um, you had businesses reopening um, amid pretty high spread. And part of what explains that is that the CARES Act funding for uh, expanded unemployment and business subsidies was allowed to run out. But there was also no pushback against, um, against what was happening. Uh, not pushback by Democratic governors or Democratic politicians at the national level, not pushback from the scientific community, which did oppose the Great Barrington Declaration's uh, campaign, um, but did not oppose the specific policies um, that, that were uh, going on in, in individual states. They did not lobby for renewal of the CARES Act in any kind of visible way. 
Um, you, you had a few exceptions here and there at the individual level, but not at the institutional level. Uh, and then what happens here with Democrats, and I love, I just love talking about Andrew Cuomo because he really like distills it in its uh, platonic form, is um, a shift. This is still pre-vaccine. This is still before drugs were available like Paxil did to, to give uh, treatment to people who had been infected. Uh, the shift in narrative to personal responsibility. Uh, it is your responsibility to wear a mask. It is your responsibility to avoid social gatherings. And I wrote an article about this at the time. They were describing the spread of COVID much in the same way that these anti-contagionists of the 19th century were describing um, spreads of, of infectious disease, uh, which is that um, the spread is actually happening in ways that uh, dealing with it are conducive to commerce and, and capital accumulation. Uh, they were blaming small private gatherings um, as the, the main driver of the, of the pandemic, which was not true. So here you have a health campaign by Cuomo called the living room spread campaign uh, to avoid living room spread, but don't worry because your workplaces and schools and gyms and hair salons are not actually worth spreading it. And using contract tracing data that's heavily biased, um, he's combining the household and social gathering categories. Um, household spread is always gonna be the major contributor because it's easy to get infected by uh, uh, someone who lives with you, but it's also very easy to, um, to contact trace when it's household spread. So it's gonna be overrepresented. And then he is uh, lumping that in with social gatherings and social gatherings are the thing he's trying to uh, prevent. And, and these um, over a dozen governors, Democratic and Republican, but mostly Democratic, were using very similar talking points at the same time. And they were using it as a pretext for, um, for still continuing to go full speed ahead on business reopening. And yeah, so you had um, th that didn't succeed entirely because people um, there still were some protections in place. There were mask mandates. That was the largest. Um, that was the most consistent democratic policy at that point. And there were some local jurisdictions and a, a small number of states like New Mexico and Hawaii uh, that did maintain some restrictions on businesses. Then there was a more concerted push uh, to do away with non-pharmaceutical interventions um, in the spring to summer 2021. That's when you had the CDC change its masking guidance such that vaccinated people were no longer uh, recommended to mask, which had a cascading effect where businesses and states ended mask mandates. And here you have a triumphant uh, reopening in one county in California with the COVID commentator, Monica Gandhi, cutting a ribbon full of masks. Um, but the biological reality of the virus and, and especially the, the Delta variant and waning immunity made it so that this um, democratic attempt at removing public health measures was uh, pretty uh, unsuccessful, only partially successful. Uh, so while there were no major returns to restrictions on business, um, there was um, so, some more minor measures like mask mandates, quarantine and isolation and contact tracing, et cetera. Um, then you have a, a, a shift once vaccination is available and widespread to personal responsibility, but not responsibility to avoid social gatherings and wear a mask necessarily, but a responsibility to get vaccinated. Um, we have this language about pandemic of being vaccinated. And starting in September 2021, anticipating um, the Delta variants getting worse seasonally, um, we had this uh, new line that you heard everywhere, and I think continue to, to hear everywhere, we have the tools. And we have the tools um, refers to, we have uh, especially vaccines and uh, monoclonal antibody treatments and eventually Paxlovid, uh, also as a pretext for not bringing back non-pharmaceutical interventions. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like what discursive role does we have the tools to play? And I think it's that we have the tools to assimilate COVID into the same social model as most other social and health problems. Um, so we can individualize COVID, we can treat it um, through the healthcare system, we can treat it when um, it's, it's acute, uh, but we don't have to worry about any kind of major collective or redistributive response. We don't have to worry um, about 
uh, you know, restricting commerce in any way. Uh, so here, one, once things got muddled uh, on vaccination because immunity wanes, um, you had a need for boosters, you didn't really have uh, a, a, a strong push to boost people after a certain point. Um, it just, the, the rhetoric really shifted. And I think this rhetoric is more about convincing liberals than conservatives uh, to accept uh, the, the assimilation of COVID into a personal problem from personal responsibility to personal choice. So it's basically you do you. Um, you can see encouraging people to even wear masks uh, incorrectly if they want or not wear masks. Um, and at, at this point, Biden is, um, I contextualize this in Biden's concerns about inflation. Um, so by, around the same time he brought in the, we have the tools rhetoric, a couple months later, he is explaining in a speech, the White House's understanding of what's going on um, between COVID and the economy and inflation in particular. And he is thinking about inflation as a problem that's happening because too many people are, bought, are, are they have money, they're spending it on goods, on material goods and supply chain issues and this overwhelming demand are rising prices. But at the same time, that spending could go into the service sector, but people are afraid to spend their money in the service sector on vacations and restaurants, uh, in salons, et cetera, because of COVID risk. So there's actually an economic incentive here to um, not just remove public health policies, non-pharmaceutical venture policies, but also to shift social norms in a direction um, where people are going to resume their pre-COVID behaviors, even though they are assuming a greater risk uh, in terms of their health and in terms of the health of others. Um, a, a very common uh, excuse for politicians removing COVID protection policies has been public opinion. Um, they say public st simply will not stand for these COVID measures. Maybe we'd like to keep them in place, but that's not what the people want, so we can't retain it. It is very true that there's a mixture of opinions about um, what to do about the pandemic and about what people want to do. Um, but I will note that this exact argument was invented in the UK before the pandemic even really hit in the UK. Um, they were mulling over the government and its scientific advisors um, whether or not to do lockdowns. And they briefly decided to pursue uh, what they called a herd immunity strategy, where people would just be allowed to, to keep living as normal. This is back in February, March, 2020. Um, and the excuse they gave, or the, the pretext for that, was this uh, concept of behavioral fatigue, which is a social science-like concept that in retrospect did not have any science behind it. Um, so they're saying, even before people could experience these public health measures, um, they're, they're um, kind of uh, anticipating that the opinion is going to, the public opinion is gonna be strongly against it, therefore they can't even try it. And we've just, we've seen this in the US and we've seen it over and over, but the opinion polls say one thing and the politicians and media say another thing. So this is, throughout the pandemic, there are, it has changed over different periods of the pandemic based on what government is saying and based on how bad um, spread is at any particular point. Um, this is as recently as January, 2022, during a large Omicron wave, virtually no schools closed preventatively in the US during the Omicron wave. Um, however, 56% of, of US adults supported a temporary shift to remote learning during this period. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying what's the right or wrong policy here. I'm saying that this, this narrative um, is simply false, it's simply an excuse. A and, um, you can see some of the demographic breakdown here. You typically have lower income people and people of color um, more supportive uh, than white and higher income people of pandemic uh, protection policies of non-pharmaceutical interventions throughout the course of the pandemic. Um, and I will, I will wrap up in a couple of minutes. So some of you may, may know. So this is the same map. This is a map from today. On the left side, you have the CDC transmission map, which is overwhelmingly bright red. Um, and it's by county. And here you have the new map, which was instated in February of this year, uh, which is kind of muted tones. That that um, 
orangey kind of color is the most extreme color. That's the high risk. So this is a, um, a redesign based, um, based on rather than just transmission risk, they are tying in complicating metrics around uh, hospitalization uh, as well. Um, and I'm just showing this because one, it's a way of hiding the pandemic, but two, to say the Biden administration is not beyond bringing experts to legitimate their uh, policy decisions around COVID, uh, maybe not as in, in a way that's as coordinated as the Trump administration. But we had this op-ed released the exact same day in the New York Times. Uh, we've entered a new phase, it's time for new metrics in support of the new CDC metrics. Um, that was written by Ashish Jha, who was among the most prolific COVID commentators in media. Um, he, a few weeks later, was hired uh, as White House COVID coordinator. Um, so he was very clearly in talks, and this was a coordinated op-ed, uh, but meant to look like an independent scientist giving their professional opinion, their disinterested professional opinion on the direction of uh, White House and CDC COVID policy. Uh, which brings me to the idea of elite capture. I can't spend much time talking about this. You'll have to read the book in two years. But basically, elite capture, um, more recently popularized by Oluwafemi Taiwo, a philosopher, um, when, when some people in a, an institution, so an institution suppo that's supposed to be working for the public good, um, that in, those interests get captured by a few elites who, through their proximity to power, or their own power steer in a particular way that advantages themselves. So uh, I want to ask the question, why was there no, despite public support for public health measures in many parts of the US, um, despite what I think is a, a, a strong arm, argument that we could have at least done somewhat better, why was there no institutional pushback? Um, you can think about media or unions. You can also think about the Democratic Party. You can think about public health institutionally. Um, and I will, I will name the American Public Health Association, I will name the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation as major public health institutions that essentially went along with the assimilation of COVID from a collective to an interpersonal problem. Um, and I'm, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna go into the, the why now because I wanna have time for discussion. Uh, so I will get to questions. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful, uh, interesting, and rousing talk, uh, Dr. Feldman. So the first question um, comes from an attendee, and uh, they ask, uh, is the leadership of CDC and state and local health departments, by participating in removal of protections, potentially actively enabling their own future underfunding and undermining trust in public health? Yeah. Um, so what, one thing that, that's probably obvious now <laughs> is that in my view, and I, I have, I think I have plenty of evidence to support this, the decisions made by state health departments and local health departments and CDC are coming directly out of the executive branch. They are not coming from civil servants. They're not coming from health department directors. Um, I have heard arguments that um, some of these officials don't want to criticize the, uh, the Biden administration in particular, uh, the COVID response. They think that in itself would weaken public health institutionally. I think I would agree with maybe the, the implied position in that question, um, which is that it's having the opposite effect and it's, it's actually uh, undermines the future of public health institutionally in the US. Um, I, I really think Public health has has um, taken a turn where it, it's going to be increasingly seen as just like a, a, a tool of elite power uh, when when um, when there are acute public health issues to deal with. So, in, in a related question, another attendee asks in the Q and A. Uh, they ask, "Are there any historical instances of people successfully pushing back?" on capital-driven initiatives uh, to apply personal responsibility to a public health problem. So there are any examples of pushback to those kind of capital-driven initiatives? Yeah, so th this is one of the things I would have said had I had more time, so great great way to set me up. But there, are, there are many, um, and I'll highlight a particular moment in the 1960s and 70s where you had a strong environmental movement, you had the creation of the EPA, you had the creation of OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Um, 
these were all issues that corporation, whether, whether it was uh, worker health and safety or environmental toxicants, et cetera, these were all issues that were individualized. Um, even lead, lead poisoning was individualized. You can, you can find um, industry funded scientists publishing papers who were blaming lead poisoning on mothers who were not washing their children closely enough. Uh, and then we got regulatory infrastructure to deal with those things. Um, they are, were never completely adequate and they are currently under attack. So what I wanna say is we need robust social movements that can pressure politicians who then can work with experts in a completely different way through a completely different theory of change. The theory of change through which these experts are working right now is basically um, relies on um, their, them having uh, positive relationships with uh, politicians who themselves are um, captured by the interests of uh, business interests and also like increasing, increasingly right-wing slivers of, of voters who they think that they could uh, swing their way. Wonderful. And uh, and I actually have a question that I'd like to ask and kind of maybe moving into the role of devil's advocate a little bit, but also out of genuine curiosity. This idea that, you know, now the pandemic is, and this was kind of came, I think, temporally before the we have the tools rhetoric was the pandemic of the unvaccinated rhetoric, which is that we have effective vaccines that prevent uh, people getting severe illness. Um, and really, uh, the pandemic now only exists amongst uh uh, people who are unvaccinated. So this is the pandemic of the unvaccinated. What is your, and you did some beautiful discourse analysis in your talk. I mean, what is your analysis of that idea and how it operates and operated discursively, but also as a counter argument maybe to some of the arguments for uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions that are out there? Yeah, there was a moment when there, um, let's say the summer of 2021, um, when there was a really powerful argument that I found hard to push back on against personal choice and vaccination. Um, there was a time when pre-Delta, pre-waning, uh, when vaccines offered pretty excellent protection against, uh, against transmission, against um, not just severe disease, but even infection. And at that point, it was really difficult to say um, we need to bring back these collective measures that some of you don't like because some people out there don't want to get vaccinated. Uh, I did have pushback at the time. One was that there are some people who have simply not been vaccinated yet, and they tend to be um, people of color and working class and low income, et cetera. Over time, that changed. Um, as time goes on, people have more opportunity to be vaccinated. And we're at the point where people who have not received their primary series it largely is because of their own choice, although I, I would question like the role of the information ecosystems are part of, uh, et cetera. Um, but they hung, the White House hung on to that point, we, pandemic of the unvaccinated for longer than it should have. When Fauci made a statement in the fall of 2021 that I think he said something like only 1% of those who are dying are vaccinated. That was not true according to CDC's recent data, which at that point had 15%, showed 15% of those dying were vaccinated. And that's made up an increasing share um, at, as people have not been boosted, um, as we have new variants, et cetera. I, and don't get me wrong, vaccination is the single best thing you can do on a personal level to lower your own risk of severe disease and hospitalization and death. But it is not enough is what I'm arguing. Um, and I do think there has been a push, um, a different set of arguments articulated once it became clear that uh, vaccination alone was not enough and that, you know, annual or multiple, multiple times a year boosters were, were going to be important as well. Great. Um, I'm going to combine two questions that have come through in the Q&A. Uh, so, uh, and again, this is a, a two people's questions who I'm combining. Uh, the question is, are there organizing groups and or politicians who are working against this new individualism narrative? Uh, what are they doing effectively versus not effectively? And then another uh, questioner asked um, if you were aware of or might have some commentary about what the disability community has done. Um, I guess they recently secured a, a meeting with Dr. Walensky at CDC, but also the disability activism around uh, COVID. And I would also say long COVID. Yeah. 
Um, there, and I, I, there has not been, in, so I, I highlighted how there hasn't been institutional pushback against this assimilation into individualism. But yeah, it is, it is important to mention what has been done, both within the scientific community and within uh, other sorts of uh, communities. And I will highlight some groups like Marked by COVID, um, which is a group of people whose loved ones have died of the pandemic as, as one that is organizing um, against the, the um, individualization push. Um, there have been unions, uh, especially union locals, not so much as on a national level, that at various points have fought for stronger COVID protections for themselves and in some cases in a, a sort of uh, social unionism context, uh, thinking about teachers unions in particular, working with groups of parents concerned about their themselves and their kids. Um, and yeah, the, the disability justice communities have been the single group that is most, um, most vocal on this. Unfortunately, there's so much ableism that these groups are poorly supported and they're, they're scarcely visible in, in media. Um, I do think that disability communities and um, long COVID communities are going to, to be the ones that stick with it longest. And th there are so many challenges there. Um, they're they're under resourced, um, and they need more. They need more resources, and they they need to find groups that are stronger than them that already have established power that will form coalitions with them. Because right now, um, those groups don't seem to be all that interested, unfortunately. I would add, uh, building on that, there's a, there's a question that came through. Um, and the question is, what does an autonomous or direct action oriented public health look like? And to kind of build on that a little bit, this makes me think of there's this tension, I think, in, a, in some of the, di the, the, the communities on the left, especially who are thinking about like a a response uh, early in the pandemic. And you talked about, you know, the CARES Act and all of that. But um, the difference between, if you might talk about, to answer the question, what does an autonomous or direct action oriented public health look like? And there's this tension between on the one hand, like all these mutual aid networks that sprung up, which were sort of outside the state or some might've worked with, you know, public health departments and their local jurisdictions and like thousands of different varieties. But then also, you know, the idea that I think you were advancing early in the talk that some real sustained state investment in a response to the conditions that led to all the COVID inequities were like, you seem to be making an argument for that. But uh, could you answer the, the this question about what yeah. an autonomous uh, public health response would look like? And I would think maybe putting those two things into dialogue with it as well. Yeah, um, I think I think about direct action uh, more as a tactic than anything else. Um, I, I realize different people think about it in different ways. Um, so I do think there's a role for it. I would highlight things that have already happened, like wildcat strikes over COVID safety in workplaces. Um, in Hong Kong, there was major strikes early in the pandemic, um, trying to get the Chinese government to um, basically do a lockdown there. Um, Dean Spade writes about that in, in one of his books. Um, I, I don't know, it's been really difficult to organize around these things more recently because the direction that um, capital and government have been taking us has largely gotten most people on board, at least on board to a point where they don't think it's worth fighting. They think it's futile to fight. Um, but I, I could imagine a different world where um, educators and healthcare workers came together and shut down communities until they implemented certain uh, safety measures. And I've also thought about a tactic of like a guerrilla occupational health and safety inspection where people bust in with the, um, you know, their, their CO2 meter, which is a, a, a way of measuring ventilation and, and COVID transmission risk and, you know, confronting the boss over CO2 meter readings. And I think that's like a great way scientists could partner with workers or other people who, who spend a lot of time in indoor institutional settings. Very interesting. And I guess one last question, and then we'll close, but building off of that, um, uh, uh, an attendee asks, the entertainment industry has continued strict PPE and testing measures, I believe on sets and things like that. And do you think that there are any other industries that will go toward that as you know, issues like long-term disability rises? Any other examples of industries that might be leading in that regard? And then this will be our yeah. last question. <laughs> I mean, so Hollywood is 
unique in that it's one very high profit margins. Um, a, a lot of like liberal progressive people there, and also where like the, the unique talents matter. So a lot of people like can't can't be replaced over short periods of time. It would be, it would be very expensive. Uh, the other industry is politics. So while while the sixty minute reporter was interviewing Biden, who was saying the pandemic was over. That interviewer had to be PCR tested that day. Um, that's according to Washington Post reporter Dan Diamond. I I don't think so. There are there are people who are pushing on the the so called business case for public health and have been for a long time. It, it in most cases it's not going to be in business owners' interests, economic interests, because the disability, the level of disability and death and and uh, absence is simply not enough in their view. Um, to to warrant what it would take for public health measures to be imposed. So I do think they ha really have to be imposed from the outside. And and also you have unions in, in Hollywood, let me not, uh, or in entertainment industry broadly. Um, so yeah, it's gonna have to come from government regulation and organized workers, et cetera. They're not gonna do it themselves. Great, well, thank you so much, Dr. Feldman. Everyone, a virtual round of applause uh, for Dr. Feldman. Uh, this talk will be recorded, and so if you'd like uh, a copy of it, you can get in touch. And uh, thank you very much for coming today. And uh, thank you, Dr. Feldman, and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Thanks so much for having me, and thanks everyone for coming.